Welcome back to another edition of the Night Report Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again is my co-host, Richie Schneider, Greg Epstein, Rutgers beat writer, Chris Nowoski, Rutgers beat writer. Guys, the basketball season is officially over. Rutgers lost in the first round of the NIT last night at home, 88 to 86 in an overtime, I wouldn't say thriller, but an overtime game to Hofstra. Um, let's talk about the game, and we can kind of talk about the season overview and kind of what what's next. Um, this is a game where sometimes you just have to tip your cap to your opponent. I felt like Hofstra hit a lot of really tough shots. They shot 57% in the game. They were six of eight in overtime shooting. Um, go around the horn here. Craig, you're in my top right corner. So give me your, your high level view of what happened last night. Uh, I mean, it was obviously a disappointing way to end the season. You know, anytime the season ends with a loss, it's disappointing. But this really, I mean, just I really capped off just a really disappointing really run to the end here where Rutgers obviously missed down the NCAA tournament, had to settle for first round in the NIT. You run into a pretty good team in Hofstra. I mean, I, I mean, no, I know they're technically the eighth seed in this tournament, but they're a good team. And yeah, just ran into an unbelievable offensive showing for them. They shot 57% from the field. I mean, the fact that they did that and only won by two in overtime is almost amazing. Like, uh, uh, it's just, wow. But um, yeah, just a sad way to end the season. Obviously, can Caleb's last uh, collegiate game ever. He retired. It retires. He, he ends with <laughs> he ends you know passing Eddie Jordan most all time in steals, which is just awesome. We'll see about Paul. We'll see about you know guys like Oscar and other guys uh, if they ever come back. We'll probably get into that later. But just just a very very disappointing way to end the year. But also in the post game press conference, there was a long one, but it just talked about you know kind of their guys like Paul and Caleb there, you know, how they spent their, you know, careers here. And it's just, you know, although it's very sad, it's also kind of like, wow, you know, do you just look at what these guys did here? I mean, it wasn't too long ago where if Rutgers got to the NIT, we'd be throwing a parade. Now today they're losing the first round of the NIT and it's like depressing. So it just really, it really just goes to show you how far these guys have brought the program. So I mean, there's so much to talk about, but I'm going to shut up now and I'll pass it off to you. I'll pass it off to you, Chris. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, like, I, I wrote in my column, like, watching the game last night was like, I couldn't help but think of the Notre Dame game from from last year, except I didn't drive ten hours to get there. Like, <laughs> um, like it was so similar the way you, both teams were were shooting the ball well. Um, and against Notre Dame, Rutgers had an eight point lead in the second half. Against Hofstra, Rutgers had a ten-point lead. Uh, both Notre Dame and Hofstra both shot over over fifty percent. Uh, they both went to overtime. Uh, the point differential was extremely close. It was like one point off for each team. Uh, like it was, it was, it was uncanny how similar the two games were. Uh, but yeah, just like you said, it was it was a very disappointing finish to the end of the season there for Rutgers. Um, you know, in February they were rolling, and all of a sudden things changed when Mawat Mag got hurt and. Uh, Rutgers kind of went on a on a free fall after that. Um, they kind of picked it back up in the Big Ten tournament, but that was that was too late. I don't think the committee, you know, really you know took that into account at all. And um, yeah, it was just. But you know, guys like Caleb, you know, they were they were they were. He was a true warrior, you know, throughout his five years. Um, he didn't he didn't quit despite you know always being hurt. He always bounced back. Um, he always, he always gave it his all. I mean, he turned. I, I was actually re rereading. Um, an article that I did with Caleb. I did his first ever interview at Rutgers. Uh, everyone else was kind of talking to, you know, Montez Mathis and everybody like that. I was like, yeah, I'll go talk to Caleb real quick. You know, he he, he walks in and, um, you know, I talked to him for a long time and I was rereading my article and I, I thought it was kind of funny how he was saying, like, he wasn't good at defense. And then, like, you see how and, – and you saw what he became at Rutgers. He became, you know, a national defensive player, player of the year finalist, two-time – Big Ten, you know, defensive play year, which is was absolutely crazy for him. And he did it despite having, you know, crazy amount of injuries. So, uh, you know, big props to Caleb. Uh, always, always liked him and uh, hope he does well in the future. But, um, yeah, as far as far as the game last night, um, Hofstra just shot the ball extremely well. I mean, like, you knew Hofstra was probably going to win when they hit the bank three in overtime and they were just, just making everything. Like, it was it was just absurd. Um, so, uh, yeah, so. Uh, I'll pass it on to Richie, and we'll, and, we'll, and we'll get into it. Uh, oh, here we go. Here goes the venting. What the <laughs> fuck? What happened? Like, Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. Hofstra? I don't even know if they have, like, a full-on campus. They have, like, a building. 
Um, <laughs> it, it was just rough. Like, there's just so many things that, like, I'll start with the good. Derek Simpson should have been starting from, like, the midway point of the season. The middle, the, the, as soon as they started struggling, you, you got to switch the lineup up. Like, you got to change it. He played really good. Cam, obviously, he's still Cam. Shot really well from three. Um, mm -hmm. Now, it's about uh, – Caleb, Caleb played pretty solid, too, for, for Caleb. Um, the rest, I mean, yeah, Cliff, cool. You have double digits points, but you got fucking destroyed down low yeah. by a forward, not even a center. We're talking a forward. Yeah, maybe he's a center in the, the whatever the fuck they play in the CAA, I think it is. Um, but you can't be get you can't be all Big Ten like third team and getting abused by a CAA forward. Like it's just not a thing. You want to go to the league like this? This is not how you do it. That's the first tape they're gonna put on, and they're gonna expose you right away. Um, Paul, I, I don't know what's went wrong in the past couple games. It's just brutal, but your, your starting point guard can't be putting up like single digits, to be honest. It's rough. It's been really rough. Um, stupid turnovers all around, uh, out rebounded by Hofstra too. Like they yeah. don't have a center. Like you should be boxing out on every play and you should be pushing these guys out on every play. Um, they're significantly smaller than you. Uh, the bench, I don't even know. The, there is no bench. There's never been a bench. Um, it's, there's no depth. Like, I mean, I shouldn't say there's no depth. There's depth. It's just not good depth. Like it is just an ugly game. They, and they played decent defense, like towards the end, but they're just hitting, like you said, they hit a bank shot and it's like, Jesus Christ, like the, anything that could go wrong would, it did go wrong. And that's just the epitome of this entire game. And free throw shooting has head's just been ass this entire year. Like another sixty percent free throw from the charity stripe, dude. They're fucking free. Like mm -hmm. I'm not saying like I'm a great free throw shooter, but goddamn, like if you're a co if you're a college scholarship basketball player, you got to be able to hit a goddamn free throw. I'll let the big man slide, and that was uh, the thing. But Caleb won the four from free throw line. It's like, damn, man. Like what what is going on? Um, overall, just Jesus, like ugly game. There's just nothing else that could be said. Ugly end of the season. Ugly game. Ugly past couple of days between the selection committee fucking them and the Hofstra fucking them at this point. Um, <laughs> it was just brutal, brutal watch. And I, I wanted to turn off my TV. Like it was rough. That's all I got. I'm done. <clears throat> yeah. And Caleb's been an absolute warrior for us in his entire career at Rutgers, but three games this season, he's missed the front end of the one and one the other team either tied it to push it in overtime or hit the game winning shot on the subsequent possession. So yeah, can't, if we, I mean, we were shooting pretty well from the free throw line to start the season. I feel like at some point, like one, you know, two thirds of the way through the season, we just kind of got the yips at the line. It looked like a, a team from three years ago. Um, but this is, I mean, I think we're at an inflection point for this program. Like Pike, Developed a ton of under-recruited guys, some diamonds in the rough. Got them playing great defense. Like Chris said, Caleb did not identify as a defensive player when he got there. <laughs> he was developed into one. Everybody on this team is an above-average defender at worst. That is something that Pike ingrains into those guys. You can teach defense because it's an effort thing. You just need to motivate guys properly. You need to position them on the, on the court properly. You need to, you know, let them know how, you know, Passing lanes kind of typically go for different offenses. It's a lot of scouting too. We've had a lot of, you know, we've heard guys talk about scout steals, like when Pat or when Ron and Geo had their uh, Manning cast. They were talking about how that's a scouting steal. So a lot of that can be taught. It's tough to teach a guy how to shoot, and that's kind of the inflection point we're at right now. We need better offensive players at Rutgers. We have a great offensive player right now in Cam Spencer. You can see how much that transforms the team when you can, you know, kick it out to a guy. And if he's open, he's going to be reliably able to hit a shot. He's the only guy on this team that you could say that with. Derek Simpson's shown some really good ability as, you know, a slasher. But, I mean, he's not a knockdown shooter. He, he's he got a, a pretty good, well-developed mid-range game. But that's something we need to see more development on. The rest of the team, though. You know, we've seen flashes from Hyatt. We've seen flashes from Paul. We've seen some flashes from Caleb, like the Dayton game last year. We were hoping that could possibly be more of what we saw from Caleb. That was turned out to be the best game of his career. Cliff, he's, I feel like he's regressed as an offensive player. I don't, I don't know if he's been dealing with some kind of injury all season, but I think a big 
big part of this offseason is going to be Pike realizing that the next step for this program is getting elite offensive players into the program. We have one coming in in Gavin Griffiths. In a few years, we might have several. We have at least one locked in right now. It's something I think he identifies in high school recruiting, but now we need to go get two to three transfer portal guys who can help us on, on offense. You know, they might not be the best off defensive players, but we've seen that you can teach that. You can get these guys motivated. You can you kind of get them in a position to play good defense. I mean, sometimes you'll miss a block, sometimes you'll miss a steal, but if you're they're in, if they're in the right place on the, on the court when certain things are happening, that's half the battle. So I, I I know it's been a long like rant here, so we can kind of transition into what what we think is going to happen in the off season. Um, but I, I do think we're kind of at a very important point in time for this program where we kind of need to continue to evolve. Um, Pike in the interview after the game, um, obviously Caleb's not coming back, but it seemed pretty definitive that Paul isn't going to come back either, even though he has one more year of eligibility. Two other seniors were announced that senior day in Hyatt and Oscar. Do you guys really think that all four of those guys might be gone next year? I would say so. Looking at, I mean, Paul, as we saw, was very emotional in the press conference, I say, which would make you, yeah, would make you think that this could be the end of the line where, and he was talking a lot about the gift cards, things he did like that, which kind of, yeah, it does make you think this is the end of the line for Paul. If it is, then, you know, so be it. But at the same time, I also, I feel like we also thought that with Caleb last year, like we saw how very emotional Caleb was after the Dayton game and everybody kind of figured out if he's this emotional, then this is it. So I don't want to, I don't want to say, I don't want to say definitive one way or the other. I could, I could see it going either way. I think one thing that kind of makes me kind of look at it is that the fact that Paul is throughout his career has really kind of been the dominant, you know, ball handler, kind of the engine that runs the offense. But now, as we saw the last couple games, I mean, now it's it's Derek Simpson's show, and I really don't see that changing next year. So it's like, I don't know. It's just one of those things where I I could see, I could see Paul coming back because he does kind of seem like a guy who at will, you know, the mission's not done. You know, he'll just keep trying and trying until he he, has, he literally can't anymore. I could see that part of it, but then at the same time, maybe I don't know. I don't know him personally. I don't know what his goals and ambitions are, so he could leave. I mean, I, I, this is why I don't – it's so tough, you know, just to predict what's going to happen because, like I said, last season we thought Caleb was going and he ended up coming back, so. Yeah, and in regards to Paul, too, he he graduated uh, with his bachelor degree in three years and he's going for his master's now, too. I mean, I'm sure that has, you know, some kind of factor in it how, you know, he's going to be finishing up his master's in four years. So, I mean, I don't know what – I mean, unless you go to like a second master or something, like there's not much left for him to do academic wise. Um, but yeah, I, I remember I remember Caleb being very emotional last year in the press conference at Dayton, and um, but 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 you kind of had a feeling he would come back. Uh, you know, this time with Paul, I don't know, but at the same time, um, he is a Jer- he is a Jersey guy and he loves Rutgers. Um, he it's obviously his home state, so um, it's very it's very interesting. And uh, but I'm just not 100 percent sure what he's going to do, but it seems like he will be gone. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, I guess we'll have to see on that one, uh, you know, regards to other guys like Oscar and Hyatt, um, I want I, I feel like Oscar will, will be gone as well. I mean, I know everyone likes to say he's like a good guy. He was a really good teammate. Um, but he, you know, he started to come on, you know, you know, throughout the season in February, but, um, that was also the time where he had to, like, he had no choice, uh, to kind of, to kind of play, um, you know, Andre Hyatt. Uh, I know he's been. He comes off the bench a lot. He starts sometimes. Um, but I, you know, you, you know, maybe he wants to go somewhere and, and and be a starter. You know, for for his last year somewhere. Um, but yeah, it's very it's very close calls. But um, at the same time, Rutgers needs needs depth. They need people to 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 be able to play. So it wouldn't be shocking if you know any anybody's back at that point. Yeah, I know. I posted. Someone asked me this and asked the experts already this morning, and it's like. It's close to 50 50 for all of them. Like, I, I don't really know where to go with this. Like, I'm, we're not hearing anything. It does seem like Paul's going to leave, and that's fine. That's okay. I think Derek Simpson can, you can give him the reins, and all is, all is okay. Or you can even go get a guard. They're already showing interest in guards in the portal, which tells me that they're probably going to need a guard. And that kind of tells me Paul's yeah. probably leaving. Andre, 50 50. If he, if he leaves to go start somewhere, I think he drops down a level. I don't think he's good enough to start at the high major. I was very adamant about that midseason and got questioned on it, but now I, I like to pat myself on the back. Good job. <laughs> um, 
yeah, so uh, not not to attack him too much, but like if he wants to stay, he's probably not a starter again. Like he's probably a sixth man, and I think that's the best role for him. I think he fits that role. Sure. Maybe a seventh man, depending on if you need a different if you need a guard or a forward. It depends on who's coming in. But and then Cliff, um, I don't really know what Cliff's going to do. I think G League's probably your best bet. He graduates in May. I think he's done. He'll probably be done with school. I I, I don't think he's pursuing going to pursue a master's, but I guess you kind of have to if you're going to stay another year. Mm -hmm. um so we'll we'll see what happens there i think i still think he probably leaves um i know i put 50 50 but i'm more like 55 45 in that category of him leaving um and then palmquist uh he also he also graduated in the if he wants to stay i think if you have that ship there he's not a bad 12th 13th guy but if if he doesn't want to stay that's fine too like see you later We'll, we'll we'll use the ship somewhere else i'm not not being rude here. I'm just kind of being honest. Like they could have a whole entirely different team next year. And right now they still need to make room, for, uh, make one scholarship available because they're already over the limit. Um, and I know we were talking about it before, like Bain and is going to come in. He's going to play minutes. Gavin Griffith's going to come in. He's probably going to start. Jamichael Davis might redshirt, might play a little, but it's, it's interesting. I don't really know what's going to go on with this team. This could be a totally different roster next year, and I think that's probably for the best at this point. Sorry, I was muted. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think we're going to be surprised at how much this team's changed from 2022 to 2023 to 23-24. It's not typically like Pike, but – he a lot of these guys stuck around for extra years because of the COVID year. Like you got Gio with the extra year, Caleb with the extra year. So we're in a very unique time in college sports in general, and we're starting to kind of phase that out. Believe it or not, it's hard to believe that we're already far enough away from the COVID year that um, <clears throat> it's starting to not factor in to, to transfer decisions anymore or to eligibility decisions anymore. So I do think we'll have a bit of a change. Um, and that's healthy. Like you can only have the same guys for so long. You can only run things the same way for so long. Um, and I don't think the change is going to be limited to just the the basketball roster. I mean, we've seen some rumors. Um, Richie's heard some things. You guys have heard some things. It sounds like Carl Hobbs is one of the top candidates for multiple jobs this year, uh, NJIT and Stony Brook. So he could be gone. You know, we're very lucky as a program to have kept – the same core that we did for so long between Carl Hobbs, Brandon Knight, um, Jay Young, we had for a while, and he's obviously been at Fairfield for four years now, but uh, TJ Thompson. So I do think it presents a unique opportunity for Pike to go and kind of reach out beyond his uh, normal scope of where he looks for coaches and go land an offensive, not savant, but an offensive first, assistant coach who can help modernize Rutgers basketball's offense because we need to change what we do on offense. Full stop. It's not, it's not that it's broken, but it's clumsy. We're not nearly as, as crisp as we need to be in terms of, you know, getting plays called, getting guys in the right place on the, on the court. Our spacing's really bad. Like how we utilize certain players is kind of, Asinine, like the, the amount that we use Cliff at the top of the key and he's just kind of stranded out there. He's not a great passer. Like he shouldn't be, he should be setting screens. He shouldn't be getting the ball up there. Like just a lot of those kind of things add up. And so as for as much as like, I've loved watching these teams and like I was just a full football guy for Rutgers for the longest time. And now I lean so hard towards basketball. It's not even funny. Like we were talking about this, uh, off the pod, but like the saddest part about basketball season start is ending is now it's football season again and football. I feel like no excitement at the moment. Maybe it's because I'm, you know, not in the trenches, quote unquote, in my mind about football, but I just, I'm going to miss this team. So many great memories attached to all these players. So many great memories in general. This has been a great senior class and I, I, I don't want this tone to just, be me bagging on them because they've given so much to the school. They've given all of us as fans so many great memories. The rack is now alive again, thanks to the senior class, but things need to change and that's okay. That's not a bad thing. That's 
it's honestly a healthy sign that we have hit the point where we need to start changing because if we haven't, it would have meant we've made no progress. We've made a ton of progress. So I don't know. I'm, I'm preachy today, but I guess that's just, <laughs> I'll just be honest. The end though, of the watching season. that game yesterday when it's like in the, it's when it's actually in the eighties, part of me was just like, Oh my God, this is so much better than, than watching yeah. big 10 basketball I've been watching all year when it's like 40, Two to forty with like a minute to go. I'm like, oh my god! So this is what offense looks like. Mm -hmm. I, like yeah. this is what this is almost the template. Big Ten should start calling and following now. It's just like, like you said, where Rutgers needs to start modern, modernizing their offense. I mean, I've, you can almost say that about everybody in the Big Ten. I mean, other than maybe yeah. like Penn State and uh, I don't Nebraska know, Nebraska or something, Iowa. Yeah, like and Iowa, like. Like the whole Big Ten is just like, oh my God, get out of the. It's like it's time to get out of the 1980s style basketball. It's like, I mean, I understand. It's like I like Boring. I hate the way. Like believe me, I hate the way like the the game of NBA is right now, which is all threes and you no know, defense stuff like that. But take it back. Yeah, oh, it's uh, <laughs> terrible. <laughs> but I mean, we got. Boring. I mean, but I mean, we got to modernize off. Then we got to modernize this game a little bit. I mean, run through. I mean. Dumping it to the big man to just to just do nothing and then throw it back out and it's just like oh my lord it's like you got to start running this game through the through the guards now and I'm watching Derek Simpson runs you know get to the hole and he might not get the layup but at least like it's just, like there's movement and it's just like oh this is this is this is offense <laughs> yeah and that brings I mean I I've, and that's a good point too like the players that Pykele and crew are bringing in. Are better a better on offense, and then if you combine that with the defense that that they teach and the defense that they go over time and time again, if they can make if they they get an offensive coach and expand their offensive game even more and get better on defense, like they obviously do, you know, do throughout their career. Like like no one like no high school kid is really great coming out of high school on defense. So if they if they combine you know the offense and the defense together, this team could be really good going forward the next couple of years, you know, with the 2023 class and the 2024 class that they have committed and uh, maybe uncommitted at, at this point. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, watching, watching Rutgers last night, it was crazy how, how tough Hofstra was hitting those shots. Like they were hitting like insane shots. And like, I feel like Rutgers kind of had a little bit of offensive rhythm last night too. Like it feels like they were setting screens, um, I, you know, I know we talked about all year how they never set, like, a double screen for Cam Spencer, like, all year. And then they finally did one, but they did it for Hyatt. And then he changed he changed the three. It's like his only, like, made shot in the game, basically. And it was it was perfect. They got, they got like, a double screen. He was wide open, and he, and he made the three. Like, that's what they should have did all year. Um, but, I mean, I, I do like that Derek Simpson is able to get to the rim. Uh, he's basically the only one who could do that, though. So, um, I feel like they're going to have to get somebody else to do that next season to kind of have, you know, more than just Simpson doing that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, Pico always talks about, uh, you know, every year, almost almost every press conference that how, like, he, he loves the staff and is thankful that they've been there, you know, throughout his time. And, you know, it, it's true. It's, it's a very good thing that they've been there for a long time. Um, they stuck through it. They help – everyone helped build the program. Everyone helped set the, set the foundation. And now – um, now that the senior class is gone, and maybe some of the coaches will be gone, it's time to hit a little bit of a, a little bit of a reset, and you know, get some get some new faces in the program, and uh, let's see where they can let's see where they can go. The foundation is set, and uh, let's see if Rutgers can can really take off here the next couple of years. Yeah, the the guard play alone, like it, it it kind of pisses me off a little bit because like every, that's why they get beat in MC, in the March Madness every year. Yeah. The Big Ten struggles so badly. And then all of a sudden you have like a Michigan team last year who had a couple guards. And then you have this year, like who, who's the team that everyone keeps talking about for the big 10 to make a run Illinois. And it's because they're led by guards. They have Penn a big State man. Too. Oh, Penn state too. And they're, oh, I don't, I didn't want to touch on that one. Cause you know, everyone hates Penn state. Um, <laughs> I mean, I but, do uh, too, but I, I mean, real recognizes real. Like they uh, Andy have cats has them in the elite eight for Penn state, no. like <laughs> they're guard heavy. Jalen Pickett came in out of Siena and just started dominating. Then you look at Illinois. Who's their lead guard? Terrence Shannon transfer. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not – they're not that far away. Like you just need a couple transfers and that's it. But um, even like like um, big man-wise, like <laughs> Illinois big man is Colvin Hawkins. Colvin mm -hmm. Hawkins is a forward in just about every aspect of a forward. But he could pass. He could shoot. He could score. Like, Well, in fairness, 
Rutgers was in on him. Rutgers finished yeah. second. And yes. from what Gio said, he almost ended up at Rutgers. And there was one thing that stood out, and I'm not going to say what it is, but uh, he, he almost came to Rutgers. Yeah. Yeah. Can we say it? No, I guess we can't, right? Uh, no. It's like a little tease. Um, well, well, but Richie, yeah. how, how, how is, be honest, how is Penn State getting by Texas? Shooting. Yeah. yeah. If they hit their threes. Sure. They're past them. That's it. Simple That's enough. how they got to the Big Ten final. They shot the yeah, ball. Yeah, they made it. They made it yeah, to the final. The they just Ten shoot games. well. But like I'm telling, like to Andy Katz, who everyone loves and trusts, has them in the elite eight because they're great shooters. That's the new style of basketball. And then your big man, it's not a big man anymore. He's like a glorified four, just playing the five. And that that's all. Everyone just basically moves up a position. That's all it is. And it's you just gotta adapt, and you, we see teams like Illinois adapt, and yeah, they struggled a little bit, and see, I mean, twenty and twelve still, regardless. But uh, the, some of these Big Ten teams are starting to adapt, and I think it's time for Rutgers to kind of just hit, like you said, hit the reset and start to adapt to this. And you have a start to it with Gavin Griffiths coming in, who's going to be that that shooter. You have Cam Spencer, who's a pretty good shooter. Derek Simpson's a great slasher. Now you're just missing a couple more pieces. If you get those pieces in the portal. You could be right back in the tournament again next year. Yeah, we have a, a solid core. We've got a great culture now. We've got a lot of guys. Like Richie, how many how many guys do you think Pike turned down interest from in the portal last year versus showed interest in? A million. <laughs> so he had R- Rutgers had a lot of interest from guys, but mm-hmm. Pike wasn't show, reciprocating it. He he knew what he was looking for, and he got it in Cam Spencer. Mm-hmm. That's all he wanted. I mean, there was a, another player who committed to Rutgers or almost committed to Rutgers. We, we had basically everything lined up. It was Kyle Lofton from Florida. We'll just say yep. that whenever we can report on that now. Yeah. But, that's... Like, it wasn't like Pike wasn't looking for more, but I think he was only looking for, like, a very perfect fit. <laughs> yeah. And it's, I think this year, like, it, it seems like, I'll be honest, it seems like they didn't like the portal. Like at all. Yeah. And that's why they only had it high at the one year. They only had it Cam Spencer the next year. Now it's like you can't adapt or die. This is the same yeah. thing we've been saying about football. Either adapt and use the portal or your program's gonna go into shitter. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of what we're gonna end up doing in the portal is gonna be dependent on who comes back. Yeah. Like we and, were talking about Cliff. If he comes back, we're probably gonna have a lot harder time finding a big man because you need to convince mm-hmm. the guy to come in and play backup minutes, and then that's not necessarily easy to do. But if, if if Cliff does leave, I think Pike will be able to land a really, really, really good big man in the portal. Mm-hmm. But to I, me, again. it's all about, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I don't, I guess it's mostly about, I mean, minutes. Cause it's like, these guys aren't transferring to sit on the bench. Like that's what makes, that's what makes building depth in college basketball so difficult. Cause guys for the most part, aren't being recruited or transferring somewhere to go sit on the bench. Like they want to go somewhere where they're going to get like the most minutes. So yeah, if a guy like Cliff, if a guy like Cliff leaves, that's almost the guaranteed starting center spot that you can just say, Hey, here you go. And they're probably going to come. But but as we've seen the last few years, when Cliff has been here, it's like, you want to come back up Cliff and maybe get 10 to 10 minutes a night. It's like, no, it's like, I can go start at X, Y, and Z. Like, it's just so difficult. That That's why it's going to be a little different next year. I think if they do get a big man, say hypothetically Cliff leaves, they're mm-hmm. going to get a transfer portal big man. I don't think that transfer portal big man's playing 30, 31 minutes. I no, think yeah, it's, yeah. it's more like 25, 15, because Wolf Oaks showed potential, in yeah. the, especially the past couple of games. So, And you got to make sure it's the right big man because you don't want to stunt his potential either. And uh, it's it's probably just a one-year stopgap, and that's that's fine. They've done it before with CJ Gettys. Mind you, different, completely different team. But uh, like the Josh Cohen kid, we know for a fact Rutgers has shown interest, and it would make a lot of sense. So we'll see. Yeah, our, our resident expert, uh, RU72, made a post about a half hour ago regarding uh, last night in the portal. Um, since we're on the topic, um, we could talk about it here. So we are giving RU72 credit for this post. <laughs> um he says two kids he knows Rutgers is involved with in the portal are Dame Adelakun um, and Joe Jones of Georgia State. Now, I think Georgia State's like whole team entered the portal. Um, at the, <clears throat> so Adelakun is from Dartmouth, but Joe Jones is from uh, Georgia State. Adelakun, 
Uh, his stats look pretty good. He's, he averaged almost 14 points a game, seven rebounds, uh, two and a half assists a game for, for Dartmouth this year. Um, two blocks, one steal. Looks like he's pretty decent defensively. Let me look up what he is on Evan Maya. But, I mean, he's a 6'8", 220-pound forward. Um, I don't know if he's power forward, small forward. Uh, he didn't shoot any three. Uh, that's just this year. He shot 41% from three this year. I don't know on how much volume that is. Me, great podcasting here. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, he shot less than one three games. So not that big of a. No, he was seven for 17 on the year in threes. So that's kind of negligible. But so, sounds so like he just would shoot him when he's wide open. Dame, the kid Dame from Dartmouth has already heard from Vanderbilt, Arkansas, Ohio State, NC State, Loyola, Chicago, Rhode Island, Santa Clara, East Carolina, Clemson, Seton Hall, Maryland, and various others. <laughs> so, in North Carolina native, so that could play yep. a factor. Um, NC State's always a pretty good program down there, so that's going to be tough, I think. But, uh, I mean, it's it's clear. They, they know what they're looking for. And I, I would say he's probably a five because he's 6'8", 240. 68235, but uh, it's just a guess on my part. Yeah, according to Evan Maya, he was he graded out as the 12th best player in the Ivy League this year, by far the best player on Dartmouth. He was one of the the best defensive players in the Ivy League. Uh, he was the eighth best best defensive player in the Ivy League. So, um, an interesting uh, player that they're reaching out to. I do think if Cliff doesn't come back. I think who they go after in the portal will be very indicative of who, like what the, the the philosophy is. So if they go after a guy like Josh Cohen, who's an awesome offensive player, but not very good on defense, mm -hmm. might show they're leaning towards offense over defense. Now. You, you had a uh, very surprised looking face there, Richie. What's going on? Uh, so he already has an official visit set to Loyola Chicago next week. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So this, it, it just transpires pretty quickly with just like football and these guys, I hate to say it, there's tampering going on. Like, we all know yeah. it. It's just like this shit goes so quickly. We know Loyola Chicago has a little nice NIL slush fund. Wouldn't be shocked if that played a factor here. Um, they could probably get it done pretty quickly if I had to guess. So we'll see on what happens on that. But I saw the kid Khalif Battle from Temple is in the port. I mean, I haven't seen any Rutgers links or anything like that. But, I mean, that's a name I thought, wow, he seems like yeah. a pretty good player. Yeah, he, he was solid out of high school too. Um, yep. If I'm correct, he was the, he was at St. Joe's Metuchen and then went to Trenton Catholic, I believe. Mm -hmm. He was part of that it. uh that program under uh, what was his name? Yeah, he was a coach there with Carl Towns and Wade Baldwin and all them. Uh, Turco. Turco, yes. Yeah. There you go. Who's uh? I think his brother's now in charge of Bishop R. And uh, Turco's actually a cane now. But uh, yeah, yeah he was he was a really good player out of high school. I would it'd be something to watch. He's Central Jersey dude, like. Yep. <laughs> Definitely keep an eye on. Um, a little more info on Joe Jones. He's a Georgia State guy. He's a sophomore. He's 6'9", 230. He's originally from Buffalo, New York. Um, this year, last year he – or sorry, not last year. It looks like he sat out for a while. Um, he, sat, sure what I, I looked up, he sat out two years, and then, like, he didn't, he played and play uh, much this season. So, I don't, I don't yeah, know he how played 13 everyone games. feels about that. Yeah, he only he played t 13 games and averaged 10.2 minutes a game. This seems like a weird addition if, if yeah. you end up going after him. Um, yeah. But do you see the consensus around these guys? They're not seven foot. They're centers, though. Mm -hmm. So, like, we have to get that narrative out of our heads. <clears throat> I think Wolfolk proved it this year. You don't need to be 6'10", 6'11", 7 foot to be a center. And that's the new age of the game. Got to get used to it. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, because it's more important to be a good passer and have some semblance of an outside shot. You don't have to be a knockdown shooter, but you have to be a threat to, to pull up if they're going to give you a wide open shot. Or and, just go coast to coast like Wolfolk did. Uh... <laughs> yeah, if you got that in your back pocket, that's one hell of a, a tool yeah. to to Andre Blanche like that was that was something. <laughs> yep. Ugh, but anyway, so we've kind of gone. Every direction I could think of to, to talk about this team, really proud of what they've done. I mean, if you, if you just kind of look in retrospect, this was a year 
that we all knew would be, I wouldn't say rebuilding, but this would kind of be like a reset year. You're losing two of your best players in program history and Ron and Geo from last year. We can't, even Pike wasn't hyping them up. Like in the, in the off season, like Pike, he would say quietly, you know, he likes this team, but <clears throat> none of us really thought that they were going to be a tournament team before this year. They played, they punched above their weight. They got themselves into a position to easily be in the tournament. We were ranked two separate different times this year, but ultimately we had a fatal flaw and it was depth. Once we lost Mawat Mag, who was the biggest breakout player on the team, the most important, one of the most important players on the team. And I, I don't think the season fell apart because of Mawat. I think the season fell apart because we lost one of our key players. It could have been any player. If we lost Cliff, the season would have fell apart. If mm -hmm. we lost, you know, we lost Caleb. The season would have fell apart. This would have happened if we lost several different guys. So I don't think it's just Mawat being gone. Like his 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 addition to this team was not the reason that like it, his loss was not solely the reason. I, I, I say like several different ways here, but you know what it is though. A part of me was thinking though is that because th their style is kind of leads us back to kind of their style needs to change a little bit. Is they played such a great like team basketball like they were like locked like this that when you lose that one piece it kind of like the house of cards just falls down where it's like they just can't yeah. replicate that great team basketball because you're not getting him back so i think going forward if they need kind of that more like an alpha score like you know what i mean like more of like an alpha like a, like a like they were lucky enough to have two alphas i feel like with geo and ron a guy that is just like give him the ball and let him and let him do his thing the opposing team's going to, like, the game plan coming into the game is going to be we have to focus on this guy. So that kind of opens opens things up for some other guys. Whereas this was like, okay, they're going to play a great team, share the ball style basketball, which is fine when it works. But as we saw, when Mag goes down, it's just it completely, like, there's no there's no fixing. There's almost, like, no fixing it. So that's why I kind of think going forward, like I said, they need, maybe Derek Simpson can be that guy because we saw, I mean, he's got a hell of an explosiveness to him. So if he can just start putting more of uh, his complete game together, I mean, he could be like a, almost like a little bit like a Jacob Young, where it's just like, how do you stop this guy? So that's that was kind of my feeling, even through the whole season. And I think an under, I think an underrated aspect of the season kind of falling apart is the fact that without Moat Mag, their full court press, their full court press, completely like disintegrated. Like it was like their press was gone. Like we even saw it yesterday. Anytime they tried to press against Hofstra, it's just break it, boom, shot and done it's like but early in the yeah. year it was like their press would just wear you down kill you and you wouldn't even be able to get and even if you broke it you wouldn't be able to get into your offense with like until like 10 seconds are left on the shot clock so it's just like that was that i think was kind of an under the i felt like an under the radar aspect to i guess this season kind of disintegrating yeah my point kind of got lost in the minutia but <laughs> we can't just go into this next season with seven to eight guys that they can play. We need to have eight or nine, maybe even 10 guys that Pike can realistically put into a game for matchup purposes, or that he actually thinks can go out there and score six points in eight minutes or hold up on a defensive stand. And that's easier said than done. But if you wanna be a program that can go to the next level and be a, a team that can regularly make the tournament, regularly get a double buy, regularly be ranked, we can't be flying so <clears throat> so light anymore. Like that's what we were just so streamlined with with our team this year. We had like seven guys for the entire season that we were playing until Mag got hurt. You know we can't do that in the future. And because we also had like you know nicks and dings all season too between Paul and Caleb. Like you get banged up in this league, and if you're going to get banged up, you got to have a, a reliable player behind you on the bench. And you know the development process worked for Pike for a while, but since the, the expectations have changed and this program is elevated. I think they do have to kind of change how they, they construct rosters too. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, interesting thing I wanted to touch on. I just found this out about uh, Joe Jones III. Uh, so he's missed two seasons due to injury. He only played 13 games this year. It's because probably he inherited the genes of his brother, Greg Oden. <laughs> That's his brother? Yep. No way. Wow. So, so, I mean, that could be the reason why. <laughs> oh, God. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, hear me out. Greg, Greg Oden, number, number one player, number one pick. Right. Uh, played 50 NBA games, tops, maybe. 
Right. That's wild. Yeah. So that, that is his brother. That would be an interesting one. Um, now, if he developed any type of game from his brother, like, uh, hey, I, I don't care about the injuries. We'll figure it out. Take them. <laughs> that is but, wild. I have yeah, no idea I just, about that. I just saw it in his uh, – in his bio, it says sibling Greg Oding, number one recruit, played for Ohio State. And I'm like, hmm, I think I know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, just wait until Greg Greg Oden will be at the rack. You know, when Ronnie cool. comes to Ohio State, he'll be at the rack. It'll be like it'll be like the 2005 All Star game. You know? No, I think. Mm, <laughs> hear me out. I think Ronnie's going somewhere a little more west, the potential Big Ten team down the line. But is he going to Oregon? That's what it sounds like. Yeah. No, uh, I don't. That's... I don't know why. Like, oh, you know, Nike, LeBron. Uh, <laughs> that was always <laughs> what. That was always my thought. Is like, you know, he's going to get all these these bigger programs talking to him, but he's going to end up going to somewhere that's like basically Nike centric. And what's mm-hmm. more Nike centric than Oregon? Bronny will show up and be like, Eugene, this is for you. So, uh, this conspiracy theory, me, right? If we had the tinfoil hat, we'd put it on. Is it still there? It's still there. I oh, my God. It. Is that the same one? <laughs> same one oh, my dude. God. That is, Reduce, reuse, fun. recycle. <laughs> That's a good point. So, ask me what Greg Oden is up to now. He's the director of basketball operations at Butler. All right. You also have his Wikipedia page up. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if Carl Hobbs leaves, Rutgers is probably going to be in need of a big man coach, correct? We yes. know that. It's been, it's been a need for years. Sure. Get Greg Oden's brother on the team. Get Greg Oden as an assistant coach. You have a Big Ten guy, former number one recruit, Buffalo, New York native. Uh, his brother would be on the team. Like, hear me out. Makes a lot of sense. Like, Do we know Greg Oden can teach Big Ben? No. It doesn't matter. He's, he's <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out. Like, yeah. it can't be worse than what, what has happened over the past couple of years. That was a big uh, that was a big talking point, you know, not having, you know, someone like Jay Young teaching the bigs all the time. So I trust Greg Oden more than most, to be honest. The guy was number one overall recruit. He was number <laughs> one overall pick. Like, he oh, it was okay in the NBA when he played. It's just the injuries. I, saw, to, uh... I think I saw – I think there was an article recently where some – where Greg Oden was talking – oh, no, it was a video where somebody was like – walked up to Greg Oden and was like, excuse me, sir, did you play in the NBA? And he was like, they yeah. said, do you, pl- you, did saw you play that? basketball? Yeah. And then they walked, yeah. and then they walked away, and he, his, the look on his face was like so sad. I felt bad for him. Like, yeah, I, I, I do too. He's, <laughs> I mean, back in the day, like those. Remember those when so many of those big men had like micro fracture surgery in the, the late two thousands. Mm-hmm. It was just so hard to come back from it. Like he had it. Mari Stoudemire had it. Um, it's just. You feel bad because even like to today, like medical technology has gotten so much better where you don't, you don't hear of like guys having, you know, these career ending, seemingly like chronic issues anymore. Like Joel Embiid, like that's the kind of stuff that he was dealing with when he first got in the NBA and he's finally been able to blossom. But like guys like Embiid and like Steph Curry, even remember how bad his ankle issues were early in his career? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's still hurt. He's still hurt. Curry said he had to like. (laughs) Oh yeah, that's right. Curry said he had to relearn how to run because the, his gait was so bad that his ankles wouldn't have allowed him to play in the NBA. So what I'm basically saying is, like, get Greg Oden, if he was a high school recruit now, probably would have had a prosperous NBA career because he would have had so much more available to him in terms of, like, advanced medical technology and, like, all this stuff that yeah. he didn't have at the time. So. Richie tore both his ACLs yeah. and stuff. Yeah, like that's – <laughs> <laughs> I was going to even say, like, uh, well, Moat Mag, like, I think if you tore an ACL, like, four years ago, everyone's like, yep, we'll see him, like, a year and a half later. And now it's, like, yep. eight months. Hey, that man's good. He's on the court. He's running full speed. Like, holy shit. Like, and then there's the there's the mental factor, too. you got to be able to just, like, think, like, my knee will be fine. Let's just do it. Let's go. Yeah, Trust me. It's, yeah. it's, it's the scariest part, probably. And, like, and like with Moat, too, I mean, it's kind of it's intriguing. Like, he's had so many injuries. And like even, even even Caleb, he's had back issues. He's had everything else issues, and he's been able to come back, you know, strong. And you know, to, I mean, he was hurt this year. Like he fell and crashed on his hip, and he, you know, he didn't practice, but like he played at a, at, a, at, a, at a high level like two days later. Like so, I mean, these guys do a lot of work in the training room, and a lot of guys do a really good job with you know you know healing injuries. And uh, it's it's very different than than what it used to be for sure. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, it might be a blessing in disguise for Rutgers because now they could get out. If, since their season is over, they could 
dive right into the portal because for some reason the portal opens the same week as the tournament, which seems pretty insane because there's also kids who are just like opting out of the tournament now and entering the portal. Um, so it's nice to be able to kind of go whole hog into that. Uh, so these next few weeks are super important and we'll probably have some updates on guys getting recruited and guys taking visits, but uh, nothing solid at the moment. Is there anything else you guys wanted to touch on before we, we head out today? I was just going to give one sec. Uh, oh, God. He's got a Jets, he's got oh, a Jets jersey. He's got a Jets jersey. Cut it off. Uh, turn the light off. Uh, Aaron. Oh. <laughs> Aaron. Uh, this is as dark as we're going get, to get. Oh, Aaron, gosh. please come to the Jets. Please. <laughs> I, I know you're going to be. I know we we're going to be on Pat McAfee today. <laughs> today at one. Please just say you're going to the Jets. End this madness. I can't take it anymore. Just please come to the Jets. Please. Get him out Stop of here. Stop hurting me, Aaron. Stop hurting me. <laughs> I mean, it's just so, oh my, I mean, it, it, this has just been, this has been, this has been the jet life. This, this is what it is. Some this call is it jet lag. Yeah. So, oh some would call it jet lag. Some would call it madness. Some would call it stupidity. But this, is, <laughs> but this is what it is. This is what I've come to. This is my life now. All Darkness. Right. Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> But all this, all, this, all this just to be a contender. Move on. <laughs> all right. So Mike, Mike actually touched on it earlier of how guys, you know, skip out in say tournament into trans into the transfer portal and everything like that. It's kind of like when dudes, you know, skip out in the bowl game. Look, I I don't I don't play college football. I don't play college basketball. I don't really? I've never made money or <laughs> had a chance to play money playing college college sports. Obviously, right? But like. When you get to college, like, don't you want to win? Don't you want to play in a bowl game? Don't you want to play in the NCAA tournament? Like, isn't that isn't that ultimately why you go? I mean, nowadays maybe it's about you know money, but like years ago, like the thought to to think of someone skipping out the NCAA tournament, like, it's just absurd. Like, just just play the game. Play like I would love to be able to play in the NCAA tournament. Like, tell them, like, tell them they're bitches. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, like, 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 seriously though, come on, just just play, just play. All right, so I, wow. under, I understand skipping bowl games, but skipping the NCAA tournament, I feel like is a totally different beast. I'm, I'm going to say, uh, no, no, I'm, not, I'm not even going to say anything mean about them. I'm just going to say they're being pussies. <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll keep going. <laughs> um, two things real quick. Andre Screen just entered the portal. Bucknell, seven foot one, two sixty two. That's about every Rutgers fan's dream. It's Miles Johnson 2.0 just sitting right there. He averaged uh, 11 and 7. Like, hear me out. Blocked 82 shots last year. Like, <laughs> that's the guy. He might just be the guy. But uh, even if he's not the guy, um, moving on, more importantly, you know what season it is, guys? It is it is almost Rutgers foot. Oh, baseball season. Um, <laughs> big big game tonight. Kennesaw State. Uh, it's on the Owl Network. Uh, I think that's a streaming service. What channel is that? I, I don't know. It's only available in Philly. Um, oh, Mike. Mike can watch it. It's a joke. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Um, Rutgers did. We didn't even talk about it on any of the pods. Rutgers uh, threw a no hitter last weekend. Combined no hitter. They're one of like I think four teams to do it this season. Very impressive. They're back. Um, where's that meme? I'm gonna insert that meme later and just big. We back up. That's it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, now Rutgers baseball plays Kennesaw, and then they uh, they're staying down in Georgia for the weekend, and they're gonna play Mercer for uh, a couple days before heading home for uh, I think Ryder in Lafayette next week. So. Uh, I would definitely jump on a bandwagon before they start getting good again. So, uh, yeah, that's all I got. I, I don't have a rant about Rodgers or rant about how NCAA players are pussies, but I thought mine was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it's good. <laughs> you, you're done good. All right, guys. Um, we're all bummed, but the future's still bright for this program. So um, I think there's only better things to come in the future. But for me and the rest of the guys, it's been another edition of the Night Report podcast signing off.